All right. Uh, good. Good evening uh, for those of you from India, but uh, other people from different parts of the world. Good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever you are, uh, I hope all of you are doing well and happy and healthy. Uh, we have an outstanding presentation today uh, from uh, my good friend Wajid. Uh, Dr. Wajid Hussain is a senior member of IEEE and is a renowned expert, world expert on authentic OBE. In fact, he has you know, worked with the original originator of OBE actually, and, and he is an expert in QA processes, outcomes assessment, and program evaluation for accreditation using digital technology and software. His extensive experience supporting and managing outcomes assessment and, and CQI processes to fulfill regional and ABET accreditation requirements. He joined the academic field coming from an intensive engineering background in Silicon Valley and more than 20 years experience with mass production expertise in a billion dollar microprocessor manufacturing industry. And, and as you can see, a wealth of experience in this field of OBE, which is really very, very important for the engineering education in the world. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand this over to him and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Krishna. I think now uh, I don't need to go for the Grammy nominations because you give me such a wonderful introduction over here. <laughs> so, and I'd like to uh, greet all the audience uh, with a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night for all the different time zones. So, uh, this is an exciting topic. It's an old topic, but it's always new when we look into the perspective of uh, application and we look into what's happening with accreditation models internationally so that's what the topic is using learning outcomes for teaching engineering courses so let's get started uh, because uh, there's some great uh, things to cover here uh, historically we will we've always been challenged you know how do we define quality standards in education in higher education uh, now, there has been a, a trend and a shift internationally and almost unanimously that quality assurance is now recognized as uh, academic achievement measured by student learning outcomes. So we're talking about specific uh, kinds of knowledge, skills and abilities the students should achieve at the end of their particular education program. Uh, capital whether it's agriculture, whether it's uh, you know resources, natural resources, now capital is redefined. Uh, it's human capital, it's skilled labor, uh, a more thriving economy. We are talking about uh, better conditions for living, health, environment. So looking into that human capital, it's now transformed from formal degrees of education to skill sets and competencies. And you see this global map here by the International Labor Organization, and a lot of countries have shifted to these new standards. And that's what we're going to talk about and go into why learning outcomes are so important. Uh, national qualification frameworks form a very integral part of national qualification systems, and all of them are learning outcomes based, especially since the 1990s, we see a huge shift and the purpose of that is so that we could go to a criterion reference system based on agreed learning outcomes. Those are the quality standards. So uh, this is a very nice resource by Serifop, and it's a 2019 uh, UNESCO and other collaborative work. It shows about 100 plus countries, uh, all of them mandating uh, a learning outcome based education system. So all of these are qualification frameworks here based on outcomes. This is an excellent resource and a lot of mandates happening after 2018. That's just amazing in all of these developing countries. So let's go into outcome-based education. Let's look into some of the essentials so we could understand what's going to happen in this uh, webinar. So when you say you have an outcome-based system, you have to develop all the components of the system around clear learning outcomes. You have to establish conditions and opportunities within the system to encourage all students to achieve all of those essential outcomes. Now, the two key purposes are success for all students and staff. So the key word here is all students. So it's very different from the old version of aptitude to John Carroll's new version of aptitude 
Bloom's mastery learning, then going to traditional OB, and now into transformational OB with Dr. William Sperry's model. So the two main purposes are all students should be equipped with knowledge, competence, qualities to be successful when they exit the education system and structuring and operating schools so that those outcomes can be achieved and maximized. The three premises of the OBE model are all students can learn and succeed, but not on the same day and not in the same way. This is very, very, it's, it's based on John Carroll's work in the 1960s. So successful learning promotes even more successful learning and schools control the conditions that directly affect successful school learning. So it's basically strategy, environment of learning, you know, uh, the instruction time, all of those are key elements of a successful learning environment. So we talk about uh, clarity of focus being the number one power principle when we talk about outcomes. We're talking about culminating outcomes here. So we need to have a clear picture of the learning that we want students to, to de demonstrate. And then uh, that is the top priority for instructional planning and assessment. So uh, the culminating outcome becomes the starting point for curriculum, instruction, assessment planning. All of them should be aligned. So uh, these are very key aspects of OBE. And we see a majority of challenges in alignment, a majority of challenges uh, with the clarity in uh, definition uh, of uh, you know, the language of outcomes, which will come to that. So this is very, very critical to have them uh, be accurate right from the start. Now, uh, instructional process in the classroom uh, should begin with the teacher totally uh, making all of these transparent and clear and making them uh, very, very uh, basically explained well and understood well by students right from day one. And we don't have kind of uh, the shock treatment or surprise treatment where you're even assessing a student with some uh, activity that's never been taught. That's not OBE. So these are some references. Let's move into expanded opportunity this is very different from the Carnegie Credit Hour. The education is based on, on uh, outcomes. It's not based on time. Unfortunately, Carnegie Credit Hour, you have education based on time, but time should be used as a resource. It should not be, uh, the, the basis should not be time. In fact, time should be redefined and we should organize time in order to achieve better learning. The teaching and learning strategies should motivate and encourage and be inclusive, involve students from all kinds of backgrounds. Operational principles should be consistently, systematically applied in classrooms. Performance standards should not be comparative and competitive. So these are some key principles here, but unfortunately, much of uh, assessment that happens, uh, which we see even internationally, uh, we see there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, comparison based uh, standards and we don't see uh, what we call uh, the criterion based standards. So this is one deviation from how assessment should happen, how grading and assessment should happen. And then we should have a structured curricular access, which means, uh, again, the taxonomic Bloom's model mastery learning, you're going from low order skills to high order skills. So curriculum needs to be uh, basically designed and uh, enabled uh, so that students can climb higher and progress in learning. So this is expanded opportunity. Now we go to high expectations, a clear expression of what acceptable performance is, both from the outcomes and the rubrics and any performance indicators. Uh, we should eliminate uh, quotas for success. Uh, any number of students can achieve uh, those standards or uh, criterion based standards. A everyone could be excellent or you could even have a, a situation where everyone is not doing very well. The other is uh, design down. Start at the end of significant learning experiences and then you draw back and you make a connection with all the building blocks of learning. It's called the design down mountain climber model. The second rule is 
faculty when they are uh, basically implementing the curriculum they should be ready to either replace or eliminate parts of uh, their curriculum which are not too enabling outcomes now outcomes have to be structured they have to be enabling outcomes they have to be uh, culminating outcomes enabling outcomes and discrete outcomes so at least three levels of hierarchy in the structure of outcomes now when we uh, look into implementation of outcome based educational models uh, there are four essential aspects to implementing them into education one is learning model other is instruction strategy then the quality improvement process and digital technology uh, i'm not going to go into uh, details of some of these but i will cover maybe learning model and uh, some details of the language of outcomes today in this session and touch on rubrics and touch on some aspects of technology so in higher education we see that learning is not a simplistic process it does not happen in a vacuum it cannot be achieved by an ad hoc approach so learning models are necessary to become effective education practice and uh, learning models represent complex educational processes in a simplified manner, creating a holistic view of teaching and learning and providing frameworks for research and quality improvement of learning. So let's look into one model here, which is quite popular. It's called the solo model, Biggs and Collins, 1982, or structure of observed learning outcomes in which they have some progression of learning. They go all the way from structural level, solo one, unistructural, multi-structural, solo four, relational level, solo five, extent abstract level. So at, at level one, the students don't have any kind of understanding, use irrelevant information, they miss the point. And I'll go directly to multi-structural, solo three. They can deal with multiple aspects, but somehow disconnected and they're able to enumerate several cognitive uh, you know actions like uh, explaining understanding which is uh, the level of blooms and also analyze apply evaluate etc when you go to relational level they're able to understand the relation between several aspects and how they could maybe fit together a sort of uh, understanding but still not complete for a, a, a big picture comprehensive understanding of the structure and when you go to extent the abstract level, they can generalize structure beyond what was given, may perceive structure from many different perspectives, they can hypothesize, generalize, criticize, etc. So, but the, 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 the weakness of this model is it just focuses on the cognitive domain. And uh, when we look into effective and psychomotor domains, it doesn't provide progression in those domains. So we are looking into uh, the three level skills grouping methodology and we encourage uh, educational institutions national qualification frameworks uh, you know educators stakeholders faculty members to try to select the right learning domains and their learning levels because if you don't have learning domains you will not get the desired learning distribution that you intend to in education you don't want to have an ad hoc approach you have to select what learning domains you're focused on. So Washington Echo looks into Bloom's uh, three popular models, which are the three popular domains, the cognitive, effective, and psychomotor. And ABID also does that. And uh, however, there are the national qualification frameworks for the European Union and media countries, they are selecting a whole bunch of uh, different domains and varying, le varying levels of learning. Uh, we have another presentation and some work talking about that. I will not focus into that in this particular presentation, but if you don't have the right domains, it can be very, very problematic for the whole nation. So if you look into uh, these three domains, we are looking at cognitive domain, Pratt, Paul, Bloom, Anderson is the revised cognitive domain, we're looking at the effective domain, Pratt, Paul, Bloom, Mission, 1973, then we're looking at psychomotor, Simpson, 1972. And what we have done, there's been some work done in grouping domains with similar learning and teaching strategies grouping i mean uh, the learning levels of domains what we did over here we actually grouped uh, those uh, learning levels which are mutually kind of uh, at a closer level 
of complexity like knowledge and comprehension in the cognitive, receiving and responding to the affective psychomotor perception, set guide response, and then intermediate application analysis. So they're a kind of uh, mutually related and closer in the level of complexity. So we just group them based on complexity and have three levels that's easier to handle from a software point of view, from a manual point of view, when we are actually assessing outcomes. So there's elementary levels of skills, there's intermediate levels of skills and the advanced levels of skills. So we have a comprehensive and holistic education process with three learning domains covering the whole human concept of education and we have three basic levels of learning. Now, if you look at uh, what we call as ideal learning distribution, we have in the curriculum introductory courses, which could be 100, 200 courses, level courses, reinforced courses, which could be the 300 level courses and mastery level courses could be the 400 level courses or whatever the structure is in the curriculum. And by the titles of these uh, courses and their levels, they're introducing some concepts, the reinforcing knowledge or skill and mastery or competence in some other course levels. So when you look into these various levels, the skills have to be uh, a proportion of all of these elementary, intermediate, advanced in each of these course levels. But in introductory courses, you should have a higher proportion of elementary skills and a lower proportion of advanced skills. In mastery courses, you should have a higher proportion of advanced skills and a lower proportion of elementary skills. That applies to all three domains. Ironically, we even had one institution purchase, uh, you know, a curriculum from a, another very established institution in the Asia Pacific region. When they got the syllabus and I was reviewing this, everything was analyzed, mostly analyzed. And it was so ironical as students are entering and rolling with a skill of analysis and graduating with analysis. So there's really not much distribution happening there. So it's very important uh, for establishing uh, mastery learning, going from low order skills to high order skills to define the domains and their learning levels. And unfortunately, uh, some of the learning, popular learning levels may not directly apply to maybe engineering specializations or computing specializations, and we'll have to tweak them. So the suggestion here is develop your specific learning levels for the specialization. The current domain is quite generic, but effective domain, like receiving, responding, maybe aerospace, deep sea diving, or, or some other way, you're really responding to sensory cues. But if you are uh, basically not utilizing them and they're not target learning levels, you would probably have to revise this, maybe the effective domain or the psychomotor domain, you'll have to revise those and create your own learning levels. So that's just a guiding uh, note over there. So when you look into distribution in courses and you have introductory, reinforced, mastery courses, the red shaded area shows you the introductory courses with the majority of elementary skills. And if you look at the bluish green shaded area, it shows you the mastery courses with a, a greater proportion of the advanced skills. So we need to uh, basically uh, properly distribute both uh, the knowledge and uh, the competencies, uh, intended competencies, appropriately throughout the curriculum and make sure that there's a proper progression. There has to be some communication with co-requisite, prerequisite courses, and there has to be a deeper involvement with faculty who are connected with these uh, different course modules so that they can develop uh, learning outcomes which have uh, a progression and a link and a causal you know, relationship is established uh, between the initial learning and the culminating learning of students. Here is a very <clears throat> elementary model. It's the Gage and Berliner 1992 model for instructional uh, sequence. You see uh, deciding on the outcomes before instruction, understanding the characteristics of students that before and during instruction, think on how you want to know, uh, you know, what is the right way of uh, motivating students and implementing that and finally evaluating. So this is a very basic model, uh, an instructional model. And if you look at uh, James Grossier model, you see learning outcomes from the basis, of course, instructional processes also derive themselves from what learning outcomes have been defined and then all the other variables, course content, learning, learning context, teacher, learner variables, all of them fit in. But however, this does not give details of learning progression, it's morely aligned to, uh, again, the cognitive domain, and uh, there's some technical detail that's missing uh, in this specific model. So 
let's look into a very simple uh, uh, concept here. We are going from needs to asset acquisition. Let's say I'm trying to buy a home. So what are the characteristics? Uh, room size, do I need a pool or waterfront? What's the year of construction? What's the location? And is it a functional home? And the most important, does my wife like the home or, or she does not? So from these characteristics, which are actually the needs, we develop outcomes, the learning outcomes. Now, if I want to buy a home, I, okay, I need a 4-3, I need a 2,000 square feet uh, built-up area, I need a pool and waterfront, I need a post-2005 construction, I'm looking at Hamilton here in Miami, and I need a working AC and, and a very nice roof and absolutely no termites. So these were my learning outcomes. And then the next thing would be for me to select a home is decide what would be the assessment mechanism for that. So of course, uh, that would be uh, specs for homes from my realtor, and then doing a home inspection from a very good company. And uh, of course, visiting the home and being aware of what to look in the home to make an, uh, the right selection. And then, of course, is my wife happy with that or she's not? So I have to decide the assessment. So the key thing over here is, depending on the needs, you develop the outcomes. And then immediately you see what are the assessment methods, what are the types of assessment, how can I assess those? And then we go into the strategies. Now, how can I learn and prepare myself to get a, a very good performance in that assessment? Selecting the best realtor agency, reviewing, learning how to review home specs or getting access to the right analytics, right tools, and, and, and learn from experts in, in, in buying homes, you know, what do I really have to see in a home? And then ask my wife, of course, what the home she likes. So when you put all those in place, uh, then you get the whole cycle of acquisition of assets. And over here, we're talking about acquisition of learning. So employment needs, uh, feed into student needs, and then uh, actually it, it goes beyond employment, but we will come to that. Uh, then it also uh, feeds into the institutional mission. And then we have program outcomes. And from there, we develop uh, the teacher objectives. From there, uh, we go to course outcomes. From course outcomes, we proceed to assessment methods. You see, because we need to know how are we going to assess this particular course outcome. Now, based on the assessment, we are going to define the teaching strategy. This is very important. So there is another model out there which right after the course outcomes or the learning outcomes, they jump into teaching and learning strategy. But assessment experts, what they say is, look at your assessment method and based on the assessment method, you have to design the teaching strategy. So this is the learning outcome application framework. So when you look into the program outcomes and you see the red arrow over there, there's other things. There's life performance roles, there's emerging skills, there's a community needs, there's a, a many other aspects that have to feed in, maybe a national vision. All of that goes into the program outcomes. So uh, let's look into ABIT model. Uh, this is the Gloria Rogers uh, continuous improvement uh, model or uh, flow for assessment. The key thing over here is it has the continuous improvement process embedded in here, which is very powerful. But the, the important thing to notice when you look at the program outcomes, right after the program outcomes, you have the performance, the performance criteria or the performance indicators. Then you have the strategies, educational strategies, then you have assessment, and then you have evaluation. So this is a, a variance from what a majority of assessment experts say is to have educational strategies after assessment and to have the performance criteria after the enabling outcomes. Remember, program outcomes are the culminating outcomes. Course outcomes are the enabling outcomes and the performance indicators of those enabling outcomes are called discrete outcomes. So in this particular model, you see measurable performance criteria are generic. So that's another aspect which we'll be talking about generic versus specific performance indicators. In this particular example, we see uh, a whole bunch of uh, outcomes on the left-hand side, classified. Actually, these are uh, in, in, the, in the blue, these are the program outcomes and each program 
program outcome has their own performance indicators which are linked through course activity. So this is a very nice uh, inverted pyramid. It shows the difference of uh, the different uh, goals, objectives, outcomes, indicators. Goals are future tense. Unfortunately, many uh, presenters they say that outcomes have to be future. Outcomes should never be future tense. Outcomes should be in the current tense. So uh, when you look into program goals, there's no action words, there's no subject format, there's no performance scales. When you go down into this inverted pyramid, you go uh, into uh, measurability. You enter measurability, you become more specific, uh, you have a focused learning domain, you have a focused learning level, you have more detail on what that performance should be. So that's why the key thing over here, performance key to performance criteria are under the course outcomes. They are not above the course outcome because when they're above the course outcome in the hierarchy or structure, they become generic. When you have generic outcomes, there's a lot of problem with accuracy in assessment. And I will uh, explain that to you in a little bit. Uh, quickly explaining the definition of outcome skills and competencies. There's a lot of confusion even with national qualification framework. So let's, let's redefine them over here. Outcomes can therefore be defined as a set of accessible culminating demonstrations of knowledge, skills and or competencies gained following completion of the respective learning experiences at various levels of education accurately aligned with appropriate learning domains and learning levels within applied within specific context and displaying clearly articulated and acceptable skill of performance. Now, what are skills? They are automated routines, and uh, these are demonstrated learning activities in a specific range of acceptable performances and complexities. And again, they are very specific related to some uh, learning domains and learning levels. And uh, when you look in competence, competence is a uh, mastery in complex environments. The transcending levels of knowledge and skill. So there's a little bit more detail here into the differences of these, but uh, these are just at the definition level so that we understand that all of these are outcomes. Skills and competencies are also outcomes, but they are more specific when we go to competence, they become more specific and the, the performance is at, at a level of some kind of mastery, which is uh, accepted in that particular context. So uh, when we look into the kind of learning that's happening today with especially COVID and we're looking at hybrid model, all the vice chancellors and administration management of institutions internationally talking about hybrid learning models moving forward even after the COVID. So we really need to look into how we can integrate all of this. So if you look into the OBE process, a lot of uh, educators uh, talk with me and they say uh, project-based learning versus outcome-based education or cooperative. All of these are, are under the umbrella of outcome-based education models. So there's nothing uh, different from problem-based learning and outcome-based uh, uh, outcome-based education process is an umbrella. Problem-based learning or project-based learning or format, or whatever those instructional approaches are, they are just uh, strategies of learning. However, the outcomes can change because of what strategy you use. So, uh, Let's come back to uh, learning domains. We had uh, a, a problem which I'm going to show here uh, without taking names. A country had selected, as you see on the left hand side, some of these domains. And then after several years, they shifted to the knowledge, skills and competence domains, which is the European Union model. And so the reason for that is if you look into the cognitive skills on the left hand side and then you have numerical skills as well and you go back to this learning domain wheel which we created and uh, this is using Venn diagrams let's say a country wants to select uh, teamwork and leadership they should either select teamwork or leadership not both because you cannot be uh, uh, have you cannot have any kind of uh, teamwork without being a leader so leadership is actually a subset of teamwork so in this model what we present use supersets don't use subsets because when you use subsets like here numeric skills right over here you can see numeric skills in the center it's in cognitive it's in psychomotor it's epic it comes in all of them and it creates a huge amount of redundancy so when you come to assessment and evaluation and check the distribution of learning 
you find a lot of problems created. So what the learning domains field tells us is using Venn diagrams, select superset learning domains. Do not select uh, you know, subset learning domains which have a lot of overlap with other domains and create redundancy for evaluation assessment. And that would be a huge accuracy issue. So that's basically what happened here. There are some problems uh, with this model as well, but uh, uh, the time constraint we will not enter into national qualification frameworks in this particular presentation. Uh, there was another country that selected lifelong learning skills as a learning domain. And then they also had problem solving. But Magero's research tells us that lifelong learning talks about self-management, which is uh, motivation, self-regulation, which and, and the other component is student thinking, which is problem solving and critical thinking and uh, creativity. And the third component is social interaction. So when you select lifelong learning, you and you're selecting problem solving as another domain, again, there's an overlap issue and a redundancy issue. So this is lifelong learning. Let's say I want to integrate lifelong learning and take several aspects of these components and uh, identify the areas in, in the educational process where they are uh, actually uh, learned or acquired. And then I look into the curriculum and then I plug them in into the curriculum. The right side over here, this is a model of a curriculum map. It shows all these bunch of uh, electrical engineering courses and shows the program outcomes lined up. Uh, this is a 2020 paper uh, that we submitted uh, with the IEEE and it talks about program educational objectives. And when you develop program educational objectives, you look at 21, 21st century interpersonal skills, you look at life performance roles like uh, being a leader, a contributor, a collaborator. You look at a national vision. You look at university mission. You look at Washington graduate profiles. Then you look into a mastery learning concept when you put down the, prog the program educational uh, objectives. Like you start with uh, the knowledge perspective, then the application, then you go into employment perspective, then you go to community service. So you go in these levels. So, uh, this has to be integrated, uh, the same philosophy when you're developing the whole curriculum, all of these aspects, so it's no longer content, it's no longer traditional content-based education, it's transformational education, where you have to plug into all of these course modules, all these learning elements, identify where those happen, and make that link. So, over here, we looked at uh, lifelong learning, we picked up some key aspects of lifelong learning, like World Economic Forum reports, we picked them up, and then we also integrate them at level two with the Washington Accord quality profiles. We identify uh, like three courses here, electronics one, power systems one, and senior design project two. We plug them in here. So the context, that's the context part that we are defining now for these particular courses. You're plugging in the skills in a, an appropriate context and developing a low order to higher order learning which happens both inter-course and intra-course level. And so the highest learning happens at senior project design or capstone. And we are also identifying which uh, student outcome we are talking about. This is just about integrating you know, skills into uh, curriculum. And we should really refer to Washington Accord. Washington Accord, if you look into these wonderful you know, problem solving profiles, the depth of uh, analysis, the depth of knowledge, you know, stakeholder involve, involvement. So my question is, when we write outcomes, how come we do not actually consider all of these? The, look at the range of engineering activities. So unfortunately, we take a seven or 10 or 11 program outcomes, and then in bingo, in 30 performance indicators, we test the whole, uh, you know, uh, capacity of student learning or the educational process. So the knowledge profile, it's having a great spectrum here. If you look into graduate attributes, there's uh, several aspects. All of the uh, engineering outcomes, whatever agency in the world, including ABIT, uh, they have to extract these graduate uh, attributes from Washington Accord because they are actually uh, members of the Washington Accord. Look at the competency profiles. People talk about effective domain, not uh, being measurable, but most of these protection of society, uh, look at that, uh, legal and regulatory, ethics, 
uh, communication, lifelong learning, judgment, all of these are effective to me. So we have to identify where we can plug them. And that's what the earlier slide was, is to integrate emerging skills with the Washington Echo profile, which are the professional society profiles and integrate them into curriculum. And the reason I'm telling you this is because when you write outcomes, you don't start in an ad hoc approach. You have to bring this whole sphere of thinking uh, into perspective and then deliver. Now, this is the mountain climber model. The reason why it's called mountain climber, because mountain climbers, they start from the peak and then they go down. They don't go from the bottom of the mountain towards the peak because the number of paths dramatically reduces as you reach the top. So that's why you start from the top and then you go towards the bottom and then you make sure that uh, you offer students the curriculum that gives holistic education, all the domains of learning, going from low order skills to high order skills and make sure the master level courses offer advanced learning and, and not the other way. Now, the, the third aspect is quality processes. If you do not have a quality process, you cannot implement outcomes. You cannot have a systemic uh, model of implementing outcomes. I, I just took the ABIT example. So you have ABIT program SOs, you have the PEOs, which is the attributes of students after they graduate, and then you have the performance indicators and course outcomes. So you need to have quality cycles, cycles which clearly define when are we going to plan for them, implement, assess, evaluate, and do the feedback for improvement for each of these. So if you do not have quality cycles and all of your uh, assessment or planning at the course level doesn't integrate with the whole big picture, then it's a very ad hoc approach and we need to sit with outcome assessments experts. This is an example of what we did in our institution. And you see, we have uh, six quality cycles, Q1, and each of these have its elements and the quality assurance uh, folks who are handling this. And there are some uh, checkpoints, monitoring aspects and uh, deliverables. So Q1 is the course outcomes, performance indicators, rubrics. Q2 is the, the semester wide implementation of these we check the syllabi we check the course assessment we check the end of term report then in q3 we have a program review we look at all the outcomes taken from all the courses and we review and it's all of this is done electronically this is actually not manageable uh, manually you have to have an electronic system unfortunately for medicine for law for tourism for everything we have uh, big data we have the tools but Unfortunately, when it comes to uh, outcomes assessment, the tools are very shaky. Uh, we need something that integrates uh, learning management, outcome assessment, advising, administration, all of them together. So you see over here, the, the quality cycle Q4, it looks at the PIs, how we can review them, improve them. The quality cycle five looks at the multi-trend analysis of the program outcomes, multi-term. Multi so you look at trends, you look at five years, six years, whatever the cycles are and you also have the program education object. So without these cycles interconnected, it becomes a mockery of using outcomes and even applying them because you don't go beyond a, a course scope. Even the course scope would not be accurate, would, would not have the big picture. So this is uh, uh, some great work that we published. It integrates uh, a social science theory, which is OBE, evaluation aspects, best assessment practice, program theory, practical framework, the tools and the quality processes. You have to integrate them, get the big picture to implement outcomes. So we're talking about the last part. Digital technology is four components that have to be integrated together. So let's take a look into what those are. Administrative assessment systems give an eagle eye view to administration. They can look at all the main uh, KPIs institutional effectiveness, program effectiveness in a short, and I'll give you a snapshot for that. I'm not going to go into that detail in this particular presentation. If you look at uh, advising, all of the students, hundreds of skills are recorded per student, and that can happen with performance vector technology and FCAR and embedded assessments. You need to have the right technology. Unfortunately, majority of schools, even if you look at NACADA's website, they talk about outcomes, but that data is almost not there. I haven't seen one school from hundreds and hundreds where they actually have outcomes data per student. I haven't seen that. So you need to integrate OAS, LMS, AS with CIMS. CIMS is now you're measuring these outcomes. You have to take it to commit 
the committees, administrative committees, you have to see how administrative committees are doing uh, with these outcomes. Let's say I cannot locate columns in a civil engineering course, and that's in the reinforced concrete design course. But then I found that, wait a minute, the engineering drawing course, it does not talk about locating columns. So I, I create an action item at a course level. This is in, elevated at the program level and sent to the curriculum committee. The curriculum committee now makes sure that the civil engineering drawing course includes locating columns. So this a feature of electronically IDing actions, having the priority status, and then tracking their closure, all of that. This, so this is a snapshot of all these features that are happening and uh, it's quite possible with technology. You know, you see over here on the on the right side, this is student data. You see the advising notes. On the top right side, you see the proportion of learning, how much of effective domain, how much of cognitive, how much of psychomotor. On the left side top, you see all the actions. I'm sure this recording will be the electron so people will come back and the meeting minutes, everything electronically done. So for ABET accreditation, it would be a, a, a microsecond job. These are some of the advantages and 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 uh, and you can say limitations of manual versus automated and you could refer this later on both in our uh, paper which is referenced here and and also the video if you can pause and get back to it this is the remote module in covid we can basically through the right technology approach everything can be done online in a matter of uh, seconds you can pull up uh, from a program to a course to a student everything could be pulled up from a committee going back six years you could pull up the data but it has to be properly uh, implemented so i would focus on for a few minutes uh, the language of learning outcomes because i give you a big picture and this is a very big gray area unfortunately and we are specifically referring to clifford adelman clifford adelman says that he examined 47 accreditation standards and he found only 18 that actually had some proper standards for learning outcome statements because most of them have something to do with GPAs and GPA and other proxies which have nothing to do with the specific learning outcome. So Clifford Adman, unfortunately, he died in 2018, but for 27 or 30 years, he was a, a, a key advisor, US Department of Education and Bologna process, US eyes, degree collection profile and imaginable incredible works incredible works so uh, you see here india also talking about the gap of the current state of learning outcomes and the, that this gap should be bridged and improved so let's uh, just go into uh, bloom's taxonomy and uh, the reason why i'm doing that is because there's consensus of experts that majority of educators when you write outcomes uh, they do not uh, write it with the proper progression of learning and there's a lot of uh, confusion in this aspect so if you look at bloom's uh, taxonomy we have three domains and uh, we talked about this earlier now uh, especially if you look into adelman's work adelman talks about one key thing he said the verb is the center fulcrum engine of a learning outcome statement it helps remember the verb refers to events not to states and events are specific actions so when when you look into that uh, they are more accurately assessed if you link them to a learning level you have to link the work to a learning level and then you could have an effective and accurate assessment so that is very very key the other thing is the words in learning up statement they have to impress. i have seen many presenters talk about uh, words uh, being in future tense and that cannot be an outcome if you have a, a, a verb in the future tense now this is bloom's revised Cognitive domain learning. I'm going to move a little faster from this because uh, we are a little short of time. You see these learning levels are very common, starting from remember, but remember all the way to create. Uh, I'm not going to go over the details of this, but uh, hopefully uh, in some other presentation, I may be able to do that. So you have remembering, you have understanding, applying, uh, analyzing, evaluating, creating. I had one faculty member write a particular outcome and they said they wanted to evaluate uh, components or, or subsystems of renewable energy systems or conventional energy systems. When we look into the assessments, when we look into the topic itself, 
it has nothing to do with evaluation actually it was analysis analysis is breaking down a system into sub components and then applying a certain theory or framework and then solving the problem so they were actually analyzing the economic characteristics of uh, various uh, subsystems of renewable energy processes so uh, this was the key difference and we had changed the outcome there are examples on how we actually uh, write outcomes and change them so if you look into uh, simpson model we have perception we have a set and guided response in our system we did not see much use of perception or set but guided response we had some application in civil engineering mechanism is the higher level of proficiency and automation complex over response is uh, uh, a higher level of mastery in implementing certain routines uh, the psychomotor routines adaptation is you're basically applying it to a different uh, setting different environment and origination is you are basically creating a complete new psychomotor process and uh, action so these are some levels of simpson but however even the simpsons model uh, we did not find application of like the first two uh, levels which are very identical to the effective domain receiving and responding which you will see shortly so here the first level receiving the other is responding maybe in uh, the law field or some other field we may have more application but in engineering maybe in aerospace or uh, in, in in places where it's very important to respond and react and to apply yourself but these are not target uh, learnings these are intermediate learning you can stay for most of the engineering specialization so then we have valuing it can be ethics and standards organization of these particular values and internalization which is you form a characterization of uh, you know yourself and it is a consistent and very predictable behavior from this uh, there are actual examples where uh, we in fact walk into uh, these uh, details uh, i just want to talk about uh, uh, some of these major problematic areas uh, we have many faculty members are not able to differentiate between objectives or outcomes so this is a nice example which dentist do you want to work on your teeth uh, so one is a teacher instructs the student how to successfully drill cavity paid teeth the other is a student earns 100 percent on the exam and then uh, yes so and then the 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 the, the declassification the teacher successfully taught the student to drill out cavities in the pay date. So the right selection here, the student knows how and successfully drills out cavities in the pay state. So this is the outcome. The others could be, uh, you know, the teacher will instruct the student that could be the objective. So you see, that's a good example of what the difference of objectives uh, versus uh, LOs are. So uh, if you look at uh, learning outcomes uh, and learning objectives and look at what the difference is uh, between these uh, objectives are statements of what teacher intends, the teacher centered and outcomes are what the student will be able to demonstrate. And that's a student centered approach. And uh, if you look into uh, the learning objectives, they are known as inputs, what the instructor intends. And if you look into learning outcomes, that's basically what the performance of the students should be and those are the outputs uh, now objectives in summary their program teacher centered the intended student competence in certain application environment course objective discussed with the faculty member will cover in a course so a uh, program objective describes broadly uh, what program intends uh, students will be able to do and then if you look into uh, uh, the uh, they are they are quite broad. They do not contain action words, and they are futuristic in in intense. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Krishna, I do I have some more time? Not really, <laughs> unless uh -oh. I think we should wind up at this point and uh, get some comments and questions, yes. I think. Okay, because we've been at it for yes. almost 50 they minutes. Were, so, yes. yeah. So you want to wind up, make some closing comments, and then we can have some question answers. Yes, sure. 
let me then uh, just uh, uh, share uh, a couple of uh, these slides and maybe that would be a good point to take questions. So uh, let me just show an example and come from there. Uh, in, in, or let's let's open the floor to questions and I'll share the slide yeah. that could answer questions sure. for people. Okay. I'm sorry so because I think the because... time limit. <sighs> I think yeah, I think it's a good idea to open up questions because I think um, you know you have done a fantastic job of yes. going into the great detail and thorough uh, you know, explanation of all that has to do with the uh, outcome-based education. Uh, the the issue here is that yeah, you know, I think that I think again a lot of my audience will probably uh, you know be uh, be uh, you know, uh, hear what I'm saying uh, and and I mean agree with me that. Um, most of the folks who are listening to these kinds of webinars are practitioners, okay, practitioners of teaching, the faculty members. And, and this level of depth is something that will blow them away. Okay, that, that, and, and now that my suspicion is that most of the audience and faculty who are teaching uh, cannot keep up with this amazing depth that you have presented. Uh, the, the, but let me put a simple uh, hypothesis to you, Wajit. Okay, see if this makes sense. One of your slides clearly said project-based learning or problem-based learning, okay, is the strategy for teaching is probably the most effective in order to get outcome-based education done. Uh, would that be a very nice, would that be oversimplification of, uh, of what to emphasize in terms of faculty members teaching engineering in colleges and all these colleges? Uh, that's one facet and one way of, uh, or strategy of teaching project based but there are many aspects of learning which may not mm. be absolutely related to projects and that mm. the, the knowledge can be factual conceptual uh, procedural and metacognitive so all of this need not have mm. uh, a direct link to projects so there mm -hmm. could be a lot of elementary intermediate learning that uh, mm -hmm. may delay uh, you know uh, learning if we go to a project based approach Okay. So we're looking at, at a big picture. So yes, at a certain level, yes, it, it definitely makes sense, but not from the start. Yeah, yeah I understand. I, mean, I was just thinking about it as a as a faculty member who comes into it from a domain area and doesn't really have understanding of all of these detailed pedagogies and so on. If uh, the first step is to learn how to be good, how to teach good project-based education, that might be a first entry into moving towards outcome is education and may, maybe I, that's a possibility yes. uh, question when the audience says what is the difference between assessment and evaluation uh, in assessment we are actually measuring uh, what the performance of students are mm -hmm. that's what we're doing that's what assessment is we have a very well defined outcome and this outcome it has a specific objective performance and we are measuring them mm -hmm. and we are putting them into scale of performance whether the excellent adequate minimal and set whatever those scales are now mm -hmm. evaluation is an interpretation of is that adequate going to be excellent for me or at a program level evaluation is that going to change if it is it going to change in a certain different kind of a setting and rubric so evaluation would be an interpretation of those assessment results. How do they make sense to us to improve education, improve learning? So if it is not applying to improvement, it is not evaluation, it is not assessment. Okay, good point. Uh, another question has to do with uh, a lot of the colleges in India have, uh, have to go through this NBA, which is like ABET. And, and 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 so there is a lot of um, data collection, a lot of work involved in getting ready and preparing the report, and and, and that really uh, puts a lot of uh, burden on the faculty who really have to spend more time on teaching. But uh, yeah, although this is part of teaching outcomes assessment, uh, but unfortunately the system uh, puts a heavy burden on documentation. How can we minimize uh, the documentation necessary for demonstrating outcome-based education? Yes, when you go to a doctor for, let's say, a, a kind of growth in your body, there's a lot of tests that they do. Today, with technology and uh, integrating all of those tests and look at all those diagnostics, unfortunately, why is technology not being applied for outcomes assessment? Because if you look at when integrating skills into education, that slide which I had, 
The last part was technology. And even all those actually fit in. If you don't have the mm -hmm. right technology, you will never be able to implement this. This is a big statement. You cannot implement this. It is not sustainable. And if you uh, continue to do that, accreditation agencies also talk about a lot of sampling. And if you look at all of this data, it's there, mostly it's a clerical and it's in those big uh, storage rooms and they don't apply to real-time improvement, remediation of student failures. They don't connect. Most of the rubrics are applied by independent raters. There's a lot of problems, but uh, yeah. the solution is to automate this. Without automation, I'm, I'm afraid to say you cannot continue this incessantly. Mm -hmm. And it is now many of the big agent quality agencies in their symposiums, they started presenting these solutions. They started mm -hmm. presenting what the institutions are doing. So uh, I am um, uh, a senior member of the uh, American Association of High, uh, Assessment and Learning. So mm -hmm. they are, everyone is using technology. Everyone, mm -hmm. this, you cannot do this manually. This is the okay. synopsis. Uh, so, so, so I guess the two directions to pursue would be one would be, as you just alluded to, sampling. Not every piece of information has to be collected. Only sampling can, uh, needs to be done. That way will reduce, that will reduce the total amount of work that needs to be done. And then, then using technology to minimize the amount of work so that the focus can be on teaching and learning process and outcomes does not take up majority most of your time so uh, what, are, I, what are some good I, yeah. technologies out there what are some good technologies yes. out there yes uh, Krishna, uh, the good technology is that integrates the learning models uh, mm -hmm. you cannot uh, say outcomes assessment is different from pedagogy and different from teaching they're all connected mm -hmm. if we are not using outcomes in teaching we are not teaching we are not teaching right. just teaching the subject without outcomes is not teaching it's ad hoc uh, procedure of presenting uh, and and for learners that is when mm -hmm. we were learning 20 30 years ago right. or 40 years ago mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. there was no salvation there was no salvaging the response okay the bell curve 90 percent would be at a poor performance 10 percent that's it, it's done it's a pipeline it just went through because of the outcome based right. quality yeah. model uh, faculty are required to reinvestigate and change their failure rate adjust the bell curve so the tools that allow integration of the learning models and teaching like you're doing teaching and just you punch in some numbers they will provide the data for you all you do is the alignment and the outcomes you write it properly so it sure. kills a lot of work but uh, another sampling is not the solution what we're talking yeah. is we're talking against against sampling because sampling okay. it kills quality okay Last question here from Sadrak Mambo, and then we'll give it to Hans. Uh, should it be a requirement that engineering lecturers should be taught better pedagogical skills before being allowed into a lecture hall? It's not about before being allowed. You learn some basic pedagogical skills, and then you continue learning with teaching. I mean, none of us is an expert in that sense. We're all learning every day. But yes, there are some inherent basics that we have to know otherwise it will become a clerical and it will become a just a, you know paperwork sure. okay so thank you so much miguel another from miguel just responding to your comment yes there will be a recording of this uh, of this uh, presentation and we will send it to you okay thank you so much so what do you hans thank you. thank you very very much and wajib this is uh, a lot of lot of uh, content and uh, important work that you've summarized and i'm sure we could spend at least two three more hours with you looking at the different complex areas and interconnected areas as you well said thank you very very kindly we all appreciated the ifes gdc iuce community per se i just want to move forward for just a, a, a minute or so is to remind uh, all of you uh what's important to us identify speakers women and men in all of the continents so I'm very very pleased I just learned that professor Wajid is currently in Saudi Arabia which is which is absolutely awesome and we want to end up building relationships in other parts of the world where leaders such as he have have not yet participated I just want to put this on your uh, on your radar screen and and ask you to help facilitate not only academic but also corporate 
uh, colleagues, for example, that uh, that we would like to engage in focusing on on cutting edge issues. Uh, uh, this one today, last week on cybersecurity and many many others. I just wanted to to mention this. The other important point. For us, the engagement of student leaders in our regional work and globally is fundamentally important. And we are preparing already for our global conference this November in Cape Town, South Africa, not only for professors, for deans, for companies, for government representatives, but also for students. We deeply, deeply invite and encourage you to join us. Uh, and then very important to, to us is we've just recently published our uh, volumes uh, for India and Africa of our series Rising to the Tops. And uh, just brilliant, creative, late colleagues uh, of those regions that contributed. And we have uh, begun the process to write our next two books focusing on the MENA region. And I'm very happy that some colleagues uh, are here on this particular phone call. And also Southeast Asia, we'll be in touch I appreciate your engagement, support, peace be with you, and above all, stay healthy, you and your families. Thank you kindly. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wajid Hussain, and thank you all the participants for an excellent webinar and listening to an enlightening uh, opportunity for our audience. Uh, keep healthy, keep safe, keep happy, and maybe we'll see you again one of these days in Hyderabad, Wajid. <laughs> yes, sure, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good bye day bye. to all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.